Well, this morning I uh, couldn't be more excited about our speaker. Dr. Jerry Thorpe, uh, for years, pastored the Great Temple Baptist Church in Odessa, Odessa Texas, uh, 38 years in fact, and uh, myself being a West Texas boy from Big Spring, just cut my teeth on Dr. Thorpe's preaching many times. Dr. Oldham had him pass through Calvary Baptist Church through the years. He has served for a number of years on the Board of Trustees of Liberty University, and he has been married to his beautiful wife, Freddie, for 55 years. And Freddie's here with us this morning. Let's give her a big hand. And please welcome Dr. Jerry Thorpe as he comes. Thank you, man. Thank you. Good morning. I've got the same stuff you do, so we'll fight through this together, okay? I'm delighted to be here. This church has been a very important part of my past. I last spoke here in 2007. That's seven years ago. I must have really ticked you off the last time I was here. <laughs> but I'm delighted to be back, and I'm, I'm grateful Freddie's with me. She doesn't travel with me much. I'm somewhere around the country every week. She doesn't go with me much. And somewhere during the message, I'll say something about my wife, Freddie, and this culture. I get some strange looks from the crowd. <laughs> so I have to stop and say, no, 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 she's a girl. So, uh, but I'm glad. Here's a different type message this morning I want to give you entitled, The Lake, The Beggar at the Gate, and The Cowboy. Somewhere I've got a PowerPoint on that. Somebody wake up Beth. There she is, right there. The lake, the beggar at the gate, and the cowboy. Now let me begin with a thesis statement for this message. Please follow along on the screen. I think it is obvious by the New Testament that one of our top priorities as a church and as individual Christians is to make an impact for Jesus Christ upon those who are not believers. Do you buy that? Okay, if one of our top priorities, and I pastored, as Brian said, for years, what became the largest church in our city. So if one of our top priorities is to make an impact for Jesus Christ, the most important question we answer is this question, how is the best way to do that? Well, let me answer that question by taking a little survey. Survey question is this, what is the human means God used to bring you that are believers to faith in Jesus Christ the human means God used for instance how many of you were saved primarily because of a television or radio preacher listened to maybe Charles Stanley Falwell Billy Graham got on your knees beside the TV and got saved but the human means was a TV or a radio preacher would you raise your hand is there anyone like that in the there's one did I miss anyone okay one out of all this crowd Okay, how many of you found the Lord primarily because of a, a track? That's a piece of paper with a religious message on it. Maybe somebody, we're going to talk about a cowboy later on that made a big difference in his life. Anyone else here this morning? You were saved because someone gave you a track and that, that really brought you to, no one? Wow. Okay. Here in Texas, if you go down a lot of roads, there's rocks or, or little homemade signs beside the road that'll say something like Jesus saves or something encouraging like turn or burn. Did you ever see one of that? That's a jewel. <laughs> Anybody see that rock and that's the reason you got saved? Anybody? We've got one. Wow. Let me ask one more. How many of you, when I ask you the human means you found the Lord, somebody's face appeared? Could be your mother, your father, your grandparents, a, a, a member of your family, could be one of your friends, could be a neighbor, somebody you worked with, somebody you went to school with. But when I said that, you got a lot of gratitude in your soul because somebody's face come to mind. And it was that person who made the difference in your life for Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand all over the building, keep it high just a minute, and look around? Isn't that amazing? We're going to look first this morning at, a, at a, a group of amazing group of Christians in the first church who shook their city and ultimately shook their world for God. 
These people were not educated, they were not wealthy, they were not prominent in any way, and keep listening. They were living in the city that had just crucified Jesus Christ 40 days before. It was a tough place to be a Christian. And yet they had amazing successes for Jesus Christ. Well, I think it begins with this verse that will be on your screen. This is the last words Jesus spoke before he went to heaven. Jesus said these words and then he ascended back to his father. And the last thing he said to us is that we will receive power. God said, if you get involved in this activity, I will give you the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part of the earth. I want you to be a witness. Now the problem we run into in the modern church is when we say the word witnessing, that scares people to death because you've got the idea of going out and knocking on the door of strangers or costing people up and down different places where you are and Jerry I know that needs to be done preacher ought to do it staff people ought to do it that scares me to death I don't know enough about the Bible I'd get messed up I'd say it wrong but whoa time out what is witnessing is it witnessing simply sharing something that I have experienced See, if Freddie and I went out to eat at a new restaurant and we had a great experience and we saw Brian and Jenny, we'd say, well, hey, you guys have got to go to this restaurant. The food's great, the service is great, price, and the ambient, I mean, you're going to, what am I doing? I'm sharing what I have experienced. When I saw the movie Courageous that came out some time ago, I didn't see any man anywhere I was that I didn't say, you, your wife, you, you got to go see this movie. It's a great movie for dads and fathers and, and those that are raising children. You got, what am I doing? I'm sharing what I've experienced. What if I'm standing on a street corner this, and there's a wreck out in front of me and I experienced it? And in a couple of weeks, I get a phone call and a lawyer says, Mr. Thorpe, we understand you were there at the wreck. And I said, well, well, yeah, I was. Well, we'd like for you to come to the, the trial and be a witness. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, really, I'm uncomfortable with that because I don't really know very much about those cars. I don't know if they were standard shift or automatic shift. I don't know if they had air conditioning. I don't know what color their seat covers. I don't know how much horsepower. I don't know much about those cars. And the guy would say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not asking you what you know about cars. What did you see? I'd say the red car hit the blue car. That's what I want to know. See, what Jesus Christ asked me to do after he saved me is to share what Jesus Christ has done for me. How has he changed your life, Jerry? How are you different because of Jesus Christ? You were living your life and you were here. Then you met Jesus Christ and now your life is here. That's what I want you to tell. What Jesus Christ has done for you. I, I'm kind of like the blind man in John 9 who, who was born blind, never seen anything in his life and he went his very difficult, troubled way and then one day he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ made mud, put it on his eyes, told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and you can see. And he did that, and he could see. For the first time in his life, he could see. And he began telling people, Jesus changed my life. And the enemies came up and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're talking about Jesus. You don't know that much about Jesus, and you don't know that much about theology. And he did it on the Sabbath day. That's wrong. And this guy had the greatest answer. He said, you're right. I don't know much about theology. You guys wouldn't let me come to church because I'm blind. And I don't know that much about Jesus because I just met him this morning. But there's one thing I know. Once I was blind and now I can see. That's what Jesus Christ wants me to do. That's what he wants you to do. Once I was blind, now I can see. Jesus Christ changed my life. Folks, it's like the Lord stood all of this church beside a giant lake filled with drowning people. There are young people in the lake, <coughs> 
There are older people in the lake. There are children in the lake. The lake is filled with drowning people. And the Lord stands Calvary at the banks of this lake. And he said, your job, church, is to get the people out of the lake. Your job is to get the people out of the lake. Now, I don't care what methodology you use. I don't care how you, just get them out of the lake. You can swim out and get those close to shore. You can throw life preservers a little further. You can build rafts and boats. You can hire helicopters to let down rope ladders. I don't care the method you use, just get the people out of the lake. And I don't care the songs you're singing while you're getting the people out of the lake. You can sing fast songs or slow songs or cowboy gospel or southern gospel or a cappella or chant the psalms or praise and worship or hymns. I don't care what music. Quit arguing about music. Just get the people out of the lake. And I don't care how you're dressed. You can be formal. You can be casual. You can wear a robe. Quit arguing about how people are dressed. Just get the people out of the lake. And I don't want you fussing at other churches about how they're getting people out of the lake. That's none of your business. You just get the people out of the lake. And the Lord says, I'm going away. And your job while I'm gone is to get the people out of the lake. So the Lord is gone. One day comes back. And boy, in the church are we busy. For while the Lord has been gone, beside this lake filled with drowning people, we have poured sidewalks, we planted shrubs, we planted trees, we planted places to eat. I mean, we've made gazebos and and places to meet and, and places to eat and places for the children to play and places to meet and places to park. And we are as busy as we can be. And the Lord Jesus comes back and he says, Church, What are you doing? Lord, just look, Lord, while you've been gone, we have beautified the shore. Lord, look how beautiful the shore is. Look how busy everybody is. Look what a great time everybody's having in the church. And the Lord Jesus, maybe with a broken heart, would look at us and said, but I never ask you to beautify the shore. I ask you to get the people out of the lake. Well, you see, the Lord said this to this early church. They just did it. They just did it. Listen to these verses. Acts 2.41, 3,000 souls were got out of the lake. Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily, every day, not just Sunday, but Monday and Thursday and Friday, people were got out of the lake. 5.14, and believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of men and women. Acts 5, verse 28, You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. That was the charge made, which means they gave everyone in Jerusalem the opportunity to get out of the lake. These people, persecuted, killed, stoned, beaten, commanded not to say anything else about Jesus Christ, had such a spirit of Christ in their heart that they couldn't shut up about what Jesus had done for them. They impacted their community. So what's the secret of their success? Well, let's go to the beggar at the gate. The lake, the beggar at the gate. And we're going to read 10 verses. If you have your Bible, want to follow along, if you want to watch on the screen, either way, from Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, down through verse 10. I'm going to read you an amazing story of what this early church was doing. Begin in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together. These are two of the biggest guys in the church, Peter and John. And they went to church at the hour of prayer, which is a good thing to do. Verse 2. And a certain man, read the scripture, let it hit your head, lame from his mother's womb, which means the guy somehow was born crippled. He had never walked a step in his life. Was carried, which means somebody had to pick him up and take him every place he went. And they laid him daily. So every day after wearing day, somebody picked him up and carried him and laid him at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And there at the gate of the temple, he begged for money. He asked alms. 
of those who were going to the temple. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple ask an alms. Now verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said simply, whoa, 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 just listen, just a minute. Let me tell you something. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And this poor crippled man, leaping up, stood, walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew it was that guy that they passed every day who begged at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And in our church at home, I ask, how long has it been since somebody got saved that filled us with wonder and amazement? On their way to pray, they passed a beggar who somebody laid there every day. The Bible said he was crippled from birth. The Bible says in Acts chapter 4 verse 22 that he was over 40 years old. In a culture where every day's food was one of your main challenges and everybody in the family pretty well has to pitch in and you got a little child born who can't do anything. What do you think they did with that little guy? Maybe when he was five years old, his daddy carried him down to the gate of the temple that is called Beautiful and set him down. He's five years old and a little guy begins to beg. And he begged through all of his elementary school years. And he begged through all of his, his middle school years. And he begged through all of his high school years, day after wearying, day after day. He couldn't walk. All he could do was beg. He was crippled from birth at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Maybe along the line, he met a girl that loved him in spite of his difficulties, and maybe they got married, and maybe they had two little boys, but you don't get very much money at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, and they live in a little hovel out at the edge of town. And maybe every day, two little boys, one's eight, one's ten, pick up their daddy and put him on a little contraption and drag him through the little streets of Jerusalem and dump him at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, where day after day after day he begged. When you passed him, You'd probably be amazed at how dirty he was, how twisted he was, how ill-clothed he was, what an outcast he was from the good people of Jerusalem. I suspect he became part of the scenery. I suspect most people ignored him when they went their way to pray. This beggar's not a good prospect to make your church look good, but he's a great prospect for friendship. He's a great prospect for hope. He's a great prospect for somebody to tell him your life can be different. And people like that are all around you. People who need Jesus Christ in forgiveness of sins and a chance to begin again. People who life has dumped on the edges of life and they're strung out, they're mixed up, they're, they're searching for love in all the wrong places. They're trying to, to crawl in a bottle and find peace there and they haven't found it. Uh, they're, they're sleeping with everybody and everything and yet never have they found anything that gives them contentment in their soul. They're all around us. They live next door. They work at the next desk. They go to school with you guys. Do you ever see them? Oh, they're, maybe they're not that attractive. Maybe they're, they're kind of the, the laughing stock of the school. Do you ever really see them? They're sitting by the gate that is called beautiful. Do we ever really care 
as we go through life, she checks our groceries, I pay them at the gas station, they live across the street, they work at the next desk, they come in strung out. Do you ever see them? People that are so lost and so mixed up. Do you ever see them? Do we ever really care? You know, there's been a lot of people saved because while they were out there drowning in the lake, somebody saw them and went to them. There's been a lot of people saved because they were sitting beside the gate and somebody saw them and loved them. Let me talk to you about a cowboy. This is David Boatwright. This is a real McCoy. I preach up New England a lot. This is not Massachusetts with pink boots on. This is the real stuff right here. If you ever remember Jimmy Dean's song about Big John who was wide of shoulder and narrow of hip and nobody gave any lip to Big John, you're looking at him. That's David Boatwright. He was working at the Buster Cole Ranch out 13 miles so out northwest of Odessa. In the middle of summer, it was a West Texas scorcher in August. And uh, the guys at the ranch asked David to go out to a tank uh, with a windmill and a tank, and it was running over, and would you go out and check it? It's five or six miles out there. So David got in the ranch pickup and drove out there and, and did the work necessary to repair it, and then got in the pickup, and it just started back toward the ranch when he had a flat tire and he didn't have a spare. And it was four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. If you guys that have any familiarity with the oil patch, all the oil field pumpers on a Friday afternoon, they're generally out of there by three o'clock. And he's five or six miles on a plus hundred degree day and all he can do is walk. And I know David Boatwright well now. I can see him take that hat off and slap his leg and curse his luck and start trudging down the road. When all of a sudden he heard the rattle of a pickup on that oil field road, that ranch road, and a guy in an Arco oil company pickup pulled up beside him, rolled his window down and said, hey, cowboy, can I help you? And he said, well, yeah, I had a flat and I didn't have a spare. He said, what can I do to help you? He said, could you take me to the ranch? He said, I'll be glad to get in. David Boatwright said, I got in the pickup and sat down beside a guy I'd never seen before in my life and I'd never seen since. He only had four or five minutes and he started talking to me. You know, cowboy, I know you're bummed out and I had a lot of days like that in my life. But one day I met Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ changed my life. And I told Jesus when he changed my life that every person I met, I'd at least give them one of these. And David said he reached in a little cubby hole and pulled out a little piece of paper. We call it a track and gave it to him and said, you may like this or you may not. Here's yours. And David said he was right. I didn't like it and I didn't want it. The last thing I wanted on this hot Saturday, Friday afternoon was some Bible thumper to change my ways. He said, this guy really didn't care what I thought. He was on a mission. And his mission was just to say, Jesus Christ changed my life. So David said, I stuck that piece of paper in my pocket and listened for the next few minutes as he talked about Jesus. Then he pulled up the ranch. I got out, and I sincerely thanked him because I appreciated him. And I shut the door, and he drove off, and I've never seen him since. He said, when I got home that evening, I was standing by my washing machine, taking off my dirty clothes of the day, and I remembered that piece of paper, and I picked it out and just threw it on the washing machine. And said, so the next morning, my wife said, David, what's this piece of paper? And he said, oh, some religious guy gave it to me, just throw it away. But he said, I got up the next morning, and it was on the kitchen sink. And I told her again, honey, just throw that away. And he said, I got up the next morning and it was on the bedroom dresser. He said, it wouldn't go away. And I told her again, honey, just throw that away. And he said, I got up the next morning and it was Sunday. And I went in and on the coffee table in our front room, there lay that piece of paper. So he said, I picked it up and I read it. 
It's Sunday night in the church I pastor. The service is over. Everybody's doing like you will do this morning. They were milling around talking. I'm standing down at the front where I always stood. And I saw this cowboy, that cowboy coming down the aisle. And he walked up to me and he took his hat off. And he said, they told me you're the preacher. I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, my name's David Boatwright. He said, I'm glad to meet you, David. He said, let me ask you a question, preacher. Could you show me how to be saved? I said, yes, sir. I can show you that. So David Boatwright and I went over in a little side room, a little babs room. We got two steel bottom chairs. And we sat down facing each other. I remember it like it happened last night. And for the next few minutes, I did what you've got the privilege as a believer in Jesus Christ to do. I told David about a God in heaven that loved him. That loved him so much he gave his son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died on a cross. That our sins could be forgiven. He suffered our hell for us, our punishment for our sin. And I gave him the wonderful message that you have the privilege of giving. That if we would just ask him. He would forgive our sins and change our lives and save us. And when I got through my little talk, I looked at that cowboy, tears rolled down his cheeks. And I said, David, would you like to do that? He said, yes, sir, I would like to do that. So David Boatwright and I got down in the floor, literally. We got down in the floor. And I heard that cowboy pray the simplest of prayers and ask the God of heaven to come into his heart and save him. David, who's been a friend of mine, I talked to him yesterday. He's still very active in the church in Odessa. One of the pastor's prayer partners, you guys that prayed with me, that cowboy's one of those in Odessa. He wrote me and said this, if you'll put it on the screen for me, this testimony. He said, I don't remember the man's name. I don't even remember what he looked like. I don't even know if he's still alive, but I am who I am because he cared enough about me, somebody he didn't even know and has not seen since, to give me a piece of paper that changed my whole life. He said, boy, that must have been a powerful tract. No, it's really not. I asked David, I said, do you carry it? And as you can see, it's worn. Keeps it in his pocket, and then he laminated it. This track is one of those little tracks that said, begin the day with God, open the book of God, go through the day with God, converse in mind with God, conclude the day with God, lie down at night with God. Nothing about the gospel, nothing about the cross. I don't really believe David got saved because of the track. I think he got saved because somebody in an Arco oil company pickup saw him out there drowning in the lake. Saw him just a beggar beside the great, saw him, just a cowboy beside the road, and in the few minutes he had, told him what Jesus Christ had done for him. Jesus Christ changed my life. Now church, you've got to decide what the DNA is of this church. What kind of a ministry you're willing to have. Do you notice that Peter and John were standing by the gate that was called Beautiful? You only call a gate beautiful if it is spectacular. I wonder if the tourists came to see the beautiful gate of the temple. But Peter and John were not admiring the beautiful gate. They saw the beggar. And what scares me about our churches and me and our lives is we get enamored with the beauty of our homes, our cars, our eating places, our televisions. There's games on today. There's lots of excitement. There's a lot of stuff in our life that's beautiful. And I worry that we get wrapped up in admiring the beauty of our lives and wanting more beauty in our lives that we never see them out there drowning in the lake. We never see the beggar beside the gate. We never see the cowboy beside the road. So you've got to decide what your DNA is. When I reduce Calvary down to your basic elements, your DNA... What is it? What's the DNA of this church? When I reduce your Christianity down and my Christianity down to its basic DNA, what is my DNA as a Christian? 
Is it one that actively reaches out in my world to the hurting, the needy, and the unsaved? Or someone that just gets really good at doing the same old church stuff, beautifying the shore? Look how beautiful our shore is. But the lakes feel, I know, but look how beautiful our shore is. But there are boys and girls and teenagers out there in the lake. I know, I know, I know. But look how much fun we have at our parties. But, but there are older people out there dying in the lake. What are you doing to reach them? There are singles out there who, who life has messed them up. What are you doing? But, but, but look at how nice our park. Look here. Look how, Jerry, look how beautiful the shore. And the Lord Jesus is just saying, I never ask you guys to beautify the shore. Of course we must have buildings. Of course we have places to meet. But the Lord said, I want you to go. The Great Commission says, go. Most of us in our churches are waiting for people to come to us. We're like deer hunters sitting in the front room. And if a deer ever kicks open the front door and comes in, we'll get him. We're like duck hunters sitting in the kitchen. If a duck ever flies through the window, we'll get him. We're like fishers of men sitting on the back porch waiting on a flood to bring the fish to us. And the Lord said, no, no, I want you to go out there to the lake, there to the beggars beside the gate, there to the cowboys, the people in your life. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to know all the stuff in the Bible. What you do got to know is I was here, I met Jesus Christ, and now I'm here. Let me give you one other worry I have. Had it in Odessa? Our churches can become nest. Nest. Where Christians roost on the weekend. And we spend all of our time because we're worried about if everybody's comfortable in the nest. Do the young people like our nest so we fluff up the youth nest? Are the young marrieds do they like our nest? So we fluff up the nurseries and the children's to make sure everybody's happy. Are the older people happy? I'm an older people. We're hard to please. So we fluff up all that nest to make sure we don't insult any of the older people. And we spend all of our time fluffing the nest so when the Christians fly into roost, they'll all be comfortable. And Jesus Christ stands with a broken heart and says, the lake is filled with drowning people. Someone gave me a message by Bishop Jakes and Bishop said, Jesus did not die on the cross so that we could have church. He died that people could have eternal life. You know what witnessing is? It's one beggar showing another beggar where he found the bread. Where he found the bread. I'm going to give you a last thought and then I'll close her down. You know why Peter and John stopped and talked to him? You know why that guy in the pickup picked up a cowboy and told him about Jesus? You know why? Because one day Peter and John were lost and a man came by where they were fishing and said, follow me. Follow me. And they followed him all the way to a bloody cross and they knew the price Jesus paid for that crippled man. See, that's what Jesus says to us. Have you forgotten what it means to be saved? Have you forgotten what it means that night you found the Lord when you had such peace and such emotion and, and it was like the whole world was new and you felt so forgiven and it was so beautiful? Have you forgotten the gratitude you had for Jesus Christ? Peter and John had stood at the cross so they never until the day that they crucified Peter upside down and John was stranded out on that barren Isle of Patmos, ever got over what Jesus had done for them. And I fear in the church, we've got over it. A medical missionary went to China and performed the surgery that opened a blind Chinese guy's eyes. And he said, when I took the bandages off, he was so filled with wonder at what had happened to him. For the first time in his life, he could see the building, the sky, the tree. And he hugged the doctor and thanked him with, with gratitude and led by the guy who brought him because he didn't know the way there. 
because he was blind when he got there, but he took him back to his village. And the doctor happened to think, boy, that's nice, but I may not see him for a long time. But he said in about a week to 10 days, there was a knock on his little clinic door. And when he opened the door, there stood that guy with a huge smile and he was holding a rope. A rope. What's he doing with a rope? And he said, I leaned back and all along the rope, there were blind Chinese people. There were 40 or so blind Chinese people. And the guy went home and greeted his family and then filled with gratitude at what the doctor had done. He got a rope and he started walking among the villages. And every blind person he saw, he just said, take hold of the rope. I can't make you see, but I'll take you to somebody that might help you see. That's exactly what Jesus Christ asked Jerry Thorpe to do. Jerry, I've saved you. I've given you new life. I've given you eternity. Now I want you to get a rope. And I want you to walk in your world. And those you meet without Jesus Christ, those drowning in the lake, those beggars beside the gate, those cowboys beside the rope, just say, get a hold of the rope. I'm going to take you to somebody that can change your life. So I'm challenging you to take your rope with you wherever you go. I ask at the beginning, how many of you somebody's face appeared and you all raised your hands that knew the Lord. Let me ask you, is there anybody in the world right now that I could ask that question to that your face would appear because you're the one that made the difference in their lives? See, I love what you're doing. I, I love the stuff you're doing at your church. Your music is fantastic. I told him at the, it, the music is great. It, it's emotional. It's right. I like all the teens sitting down here. I, I like so much you're doing. But guys, bottom line, bottom line, are we getting people saved? Are you a witness for Jesus Christ where you are? Does it stay with you all the time? Do they know the Lord? If I could just say what Jesus Christ has done for me. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you one more question, then we'll have a word of, a time of prayer and, and a chance for you to come pray if you'd like. How many of you would say, Jerry, there's somebody I work with, somebody I go to school with, somebody in my family, there's somebody I know and I care for them and they're lost. I just want you to pray that somehow I can see them saved. Somebody in your world is lost. To the best of your knowledge, they're lost. But boy, you'd like to see them know the Lord. Would you raise your hand? How many like that all around? Wow. I'm going to give you a chance to just come and get on your knees. Do you love them enough to come and get on your knees and pray, God save my mama, God save my brother, God save grandmother, God save my cousin. Do you, the guy I work with, the kids at school, do you love the Lord enough and care enough to say they're out there drowning in the lake? God help me. God help us. Let's stand together with heads bowed. Even before we have some music, would you like to come right now and get on your knees while heads are bowed and pray for that person in your life who doesn't know the Lord? Would you like to come and pray that God would help you have a burden for the people in your world that you just wouldn't pass them without loving them, without praying for them? Would you come from all over this building and just get on your knees and say, God, forgive me for beautifying the shore. God, forgive me for just fluffing up the nest when there are people lost. So please come. They will never be saved until we care. They will never know the Lord until our hearts get burdened about this till we weep at an altar and say, God, change me. Change me. Forgive me. Father, th thank you for your word. And thank you for the opportunity to represent you. And Lord, I pray this church might arise as an army here in Grand Prairie that would saturate schools, neighborhoods, workplaces with the fact that God lives and Jesus is the Son of God and He is a life-changing Savior. God help us to do it. Now we wait just a moment. If you'd like to come from wherever you are, just come quietly and kneel here at the front. 
and pray for the one in your life that you're burdened about. Pray for the one you need to see saved.